If this is your land, where are your stories? If these are your news, where are your views? With the headlines and hashtags this week, I am Sisanda Alutambolegwa. Join us on the People's Perspective and let the hashtag be heard. Here are your top stories in South African news this week. Ramaphosa cautions against celebrating too soon and Inkata Freedom Party calls for the reinstatement of the death sentence. With the headlines and hashtags this week, I am Sisanda Lutambolegwa. Thank you for joining us. As the uh, country moves to lockdown alert level two, President Cyril Ramaphosa has warned the nation against celebrating too soon. On Saturday night, the president announced that the country would now be moving from lockdown level alert three to uh, lockdown alert level two uh, due to a drop in the new COVID-19 confirmed cases. The president says that more attention will now be given to developing the country's economy, which has been hard hit by this pandemic. During this difficult period, what all of us have longed for as South Africans, most of all, is to be healthy, restore our livelihoods, and rebuild our economy. I address you this evening amid signs of hope we are making progress in our fight against COVID-19 on a number of fronts. Over the last three weeks, the number of new confirmed cases has dropped from a peak of over 12,000 a day to an average of over the past week of around 5,000 a day. The announcement made by the president has been welcomed by South Africans Ramaphosa also says that uh, government will not hesitate to reimpose strict lockdown regulations should resurgence of this virus occur. Now, I know that we do not ordinarily do this in the middle of a news bulletin, but it was something that I felt like needed to be said. As the country moves down to a lower alert level, which is alert level two, I want to remind everyone that we are still in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. We are still living through a time that has damaged a lot of us and has changed the way in which we know life to be. This pandemic for many of us has been a time of loss. Loss of income, loss of employment, loss of opportunity, and for many of us, loss of life. The coronavirus has taken from us so much that we have never, ever, ever imagined that we'd be living through a time like this. So I want to say that can we all proceed with caution? You need to consider yourself lucky if you come out of this pandemic unscathed. If, you have, if, you, if the only recollection you have of the coronavirus pandemic in this country has been just staying at home for five months, then you are blessed. Because for many of us, it has taken our lifelines. It has taken people that we hold dearest to our hearts. So please, the last thing we'd want is a second wave to come and rob us again of our loved ones. I want to encourage all of you, as we move down to alert level two, please proceed with caution. Please bear in mind how deadly this virus can be. The Inkata Freedom Party, also known as the IFP, is calling for the reinstatement of the death sentence for perpetrators of serious crimes such as the murder and rape of women. Party President Velenko Sinichabisa made the announcement while addressing an open-air church service in Umtualume in KwaZulu-Natal. Khabisa says that the IFP is going to lobby the people of South Africa uh, in a campaign for the referendum for government to test the opinion of the people in South Africa on death penalty.
The month of August is a women's month in our country where we should be celebrating and recognizing the role played by our women in bringing freedom of our country. Unfortunately, we meet here today instead of celebrating particular men, the merciless killing of our women. The IFP in August last year on 24th, when Prince Mangosu Telezi handed over the baton of leadership, he gave us a specific mandate. He said, protect women and children. The merciless killing of our women is something that cannot be allowed to carry on unattended. The IFP is converging here with different denominations to do two things. The first one is to ask and pray to God to intervene. This comes after the discovery of five dead women whose bodies were found in uh, sugarcane fields in Umtualume, KZN. Police have confirmed that two suspects were taken in for questioning uh, in connection with these murders. One was subsequently found dead in an alleged suicide and the other did not appear in court because the case wasn't enrolled due to what a court official describes as a lack of evidence. We are now going to head over to the sports desk uh, to see what's been happening in the world of sport this week. Dylan, over to you. Thank you, Sisanda. Kicking off with news from Formula One, Lewis Hamilton continued his dominance by claiming a victory in the Spanish Grand Prix. Max Verstappen and Valtteri Bottas rounded off the podium places. Racing points had a particularly good weekend with Lance Stroll and Sergio Perez finishing in the fourth and fifth place, respectively. In the cricket world, Chris Nenzani has resigned as Cricket South Africa president with immediate effect. This news came 24 hours after Cricket South Africa dismissed Chief Operations Officer Nasai Appiah for transgressions of a serious nature. In football in action, Bayern Munich really crushed Spanish giants Barcelona in an astonishing 8-2 victory, which sees the Germans go through to the semi-final of the Champions League. Paris Saint-Germain left it late in their victory against Atalanta in their 2-1 victory. Two major shocks in the remaining two quarterfinals as RB Leipzig knocked out Atletico Madrid in a tight affair. Lyon beat favourites Manchester City 3-1 in the last quarterfinal, which is a result not many would have seen coming. The semi-finals of the Champions League will be taking place on Tuesday the 18th of August and Wednesday the 19th of August as Bayern Munich take on Lyon and PSG will come up against RB Leipzig. In PSL action, Cape Town City defied all the odds as they beat Mama Laudi Sundowns 3-2 on Monday night. Orlando Pratt and Bidlis Wits played out to a 0-0 draw and Kaiser Chiefs came out on top against Polo Kwane City in a 3-2 win for the Amakosi. Tuesday night action sees Bidlis Wits take on Golden Arrows, Chippy United face Highlands Park and Orlando Pratt's a round of action against Barack FC. That's all from the sports desk. Back to you, Sisanda. On this week's segment of Let the Hashtag Be Heard, we are unpacking hashtag Josie to Stellenbosch. <laughs> You are used to killing black innocent souls. Do it today. The same day is going to repeat itself. Continue protecting white privilege. On this week's segment of uh, Let the Hashtag Be Heard, we are unpacking the hashtag, hashtag Josie to Stellenbosch, which we've come to know through social media as a group of young activists who embarked on a journey to travel from Johannesburg to Stellenbosch by foot. 
the collective, says that they embarked on this uh, trip to, in their words, confront settler colonialism head on. I am now joined by one of the activists, Oredire Zemasebe, who uh, is going to now unpack this hashtag for us. Dira, thank you for joining us. Sure, sure, Sisanda. Thank you for having me. Uh, firstly, take us through the inception of hashtag Josie to Stellenbosch. Uh, what sparked the idea to embark on protest nature, protest action rather, of this nature, and uh, why? Sure. So the hashtag Josie to Stellenbosch movement uh, started on the 16th of June, and uh, it was in essence us trying to reflect on you know the state of the youth in the country today in terms of responding to their own political social and economic conditions and you know this year was 44 years since the 1976 youth uprising and we were in a sense trying to you know see how far we've come you know as a black radical youth in terms of our ability to speak to the conditions that affect us and now in terms of our ability to speak truth to power so we decided that on the 16th of june we're going to start our march from soweto avalon cemetery towards the town of stellenbosch in the western Cape. so so now the hashtag josie to stellenbosch activists have been seen to describe stellenbosch as uh, the center of everything wrong with South Africa. I guess the question on everyone's lips has been, why Stellenbosch specifically? And why not, for argument's sake, Orania? Mm. Sure. So we've identified Stellenbosch as, you know, a cultural and economic hub of, you know, white Africana minority capital. And we believe that uh, other places such as your Orania uh, are merely byproducts of what, in essence, the Stellenbosch uh, history and, uh, you know, the Stellenbosch initiative is. Stellenbosch, remember, is also one of the oldest Afrikaner towns and is one of the towns where historically and culturally the Afrikaner national identity is continuously produced and reproduced. You would know that, for example, the, your likes of Hendrik Verwoods grew up in Stellenbosch, went to school in Stellenbosch. The likes of your Herzog grew up and went to school in Stellenbosch. Uh, even the last apartheid president, F.W. de Klerk, grew up and went to school here in Stellenbosch. And in 1948, when the apartheid, when, when Afrikaners decided that they were going to adopt a policy called apartheid, a policy that was going to economically, socially, and politically subjugate black people, Stellenbosch was one of the key areas where they they held the numerous consultations amongst each other and you know key decisions on apartheid becoming a reality in South Africa were taken in and around Stellenbosch around those times. Sure. So I'm sure a lot of people have been wondering about the physical and emotional experience of walking across the country by foot, especially under the abnormal circumstances brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent regulations. Uh, take us through that journey. What was it like? Sure. So, as we've said before, time and time again, that we're not in a position to reflect on the journey per se, because we believe that we're still on the march. We believe that the fight still continues up until there is some kind of significant, you know, difference or change that happens to the lives of ordinary black people. We will not stop. What, what, whatever it is that we're doing. So not as a way of reflecting, but maybe as a way of commenting. Uh, I would say that, I mean, you know, naturally, uh, the, the, the journey was tedious, you know, it was um, harsh against, uh, you know, the physical body. We left Johannesburg in the dead of winter on the 16th of June. And even on the specific day where we left, uh, it was raining when we left, so we took going towards the Val. We walked in that rain and, you know, we've been, subjecting our bodies to the same kind of, you know, fight with the elements. We sleep, we slept and sleep outside in our tents. Sometimes we had nothing to eat at all. And we, we, we rightfully understood that this is the conditions that we must subject our bodies to in order to make out of this whole thing a genuine and an immediate struggle. That is why uh, some of the people that decided to join us in those earlier days eventually turned back because they realized that this was not going to be some you know cloud seeking hype kind of a movement but these people were more than prepared to subject themselves to those conditions 
and yeah that's what we've done and this is what we are doing up until every black south african is on the same wavelength in terms of the seriousness that needs to be you know taken in in, in terms of trying to find a true humanity for our people in this country so, so now upon your arrival in 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 the city of or in the town of stellenbosch we've seen footage of protest action and uh, clashes with law enforcement and um, police officials which allegedly led to several arrests what exactly happened so we entered stellenbosch on the 8th of july right and when we entered stellenbosch we were met with other, from we were met by other activists from the cape metro and there was no clash with the police we walked into stellenbosch it was raining on the 8th or 9th of july we were carrying our blankets and we walked into stellenbosch and the police asked us where are you going and we said we're going to um remgro headquarters right and there was no clash we met up with other activists from the cape metro inside stellenbosch we marched around the town and there was no clash i think the problem became when the police was, were able to identify that these are the same people that have said that uh, you know stellenbosch is the battlefield in terms of you know speaking to the the social and economic injustices and imbalances of this country but then by that time we'd already left stellenbosch and then we regrouped and went back uh, to the throwing pot and on the 12th of august we decided that we're going to march back into stellenbosch now at this time there's already a heightened sense of awareness from the local government and the, the local law enforcement so what they did was that on the 12th of august in the morning when we were leaving the township of kaimandi they barricaded us on the exit of kaimandi and refused us entry into stellenbosch and we had a violent interaction with the police on that morning of the 12th because they wanted to disperse us and we refused and said but what is the issue and their their, their initial approach was that we in contravention of the national disaster act you know uh, the covid regulations and we said it's fine we are more than willing to comply we are more than willing to walk in two by twos we are more than willing to social distance and walk into town and it was clear from the onset that they were not prepared to let this group of people no matter how compliant they can try and be to enter the town of stellenbosch and that is when they decided that they were going to disperse the crowd and uh, we said that they must do what they feel necessary but we, there was no way we were going to turn back so they dispersed the crowd by use of stun grenades and rubber bullets and those of us who resisted were then subsequently arrested and the rest of you know the day was in an in interaction of you know clashes between the police and protesters as well as the uh, abashali and the surrounding t- uh, townships uh, very uh, traumatic scenes that you describe there. Um, another thing that we want to know from you, uh, Ori Diredze, is does the hashtag Josie to Stellenbosch uh, collective align with any particular political party or ideology? And why or why not is this the case? Sure. So we don't, we don't affiliate with any political party, right? Uh, but in terms of ideology, we, we, we describe and identify ourselves as black consciousness, activists we describe ourselves as pan africanists and we describe ourselves as feminists we describe ourselves as members of the lgbtqi community and those are the ideologies and the identities that we are inclined to uh, but we have no political affiliation uh, with anyone whatsoever we know that the pan, pan africanist congress of azania has been very supportive towards us and they've taken a position to be in solidarity with us officially and we appreciated and acknowledged that contribution and that solidarity from their side, and we continue to appreciate their assistance. We know that even the economic freedom fighters have also, uh, you know, uh, pledged their support and their solidarity towards uh, the, the, the the objectives of the movement. And even within our own core of the people who are part of the Church of Watch, we have members of the Pan Africanist Congress, we have members of the Black Consciousness Movement United, we have members of the Economic Freedom Fighters, we even have members of the ANC. And we 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 only identify with each other as black people. And whatever political support that we receive at any given time that is genuine and sincere and seeks to assist us in in, in, in you know realizing our objectives is a contribution that will owe that that we will receive with open arms. But we are black people and we don't belong to any political party organization. 
so you've mentioned that uh, you are still in the, the, the town of Stellenbosch. Um, where to from here? Uh, what, is the, what, is, what, what is your next objective? What does it look like? So the next step from here is to organize and organize and organize. I think you, you might have been aware of the various land occupations that have been happening in the Western Cape over the, I think, past six, six or eight weeks or so have been more intense, I think, than any other time in, in, in the, you know, the history of land occupations in the Western Cape. So to us, it has become increasingly uh, apparent that black people are at a heightened state of, you know, volat volatility. And we need to make sure that we channel and direct all, you know, the energy towards its rightful, you know, and logical conclusion, which is the existence of a racial capitalist system that continues to hold this country at ransom and is also backed up by a lot of racist, uh, you know, cultural undertones that seek to continually, you know, create a division between black people and other, other people of this country. So we are saying that our role is to do one, it is to organize people and to make them aware that you will, you, you will blame the government up until you are dead. The truth is that there is a system that operates on a bigger scale than the government. And the government is in, in essence a mere, you know, sub subsidiary of this system that controls, you know, uh, the conditions of black people in South Africa, which we've identified as a white Africana minority system. All right. Thank you so much, Ore Direza, for giving us insight into hashtag Josie to Stellenbosch. Here from us, we wish you all the best in the fight uh, for the liberation of our people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Susan. Sure. That's it from us uh, here at The People's Perspective. We are going to keep making sure that your hashtags are being heard. Uh, thank you for tuning in and see you next time.